What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Erica, from the Classy Climb blog with my glare glasses on. Anyway, you guys, if you don't know who I am, I'm the author of the Smart Pro Millionaire book, How to Invest in People, Businesses, and Real Estate from the Palm of Your Hand. You can grab that on Amazon and part two when it's available. I will let y'all know. But I have a very distinguished guest on here. I'm going to put my official on. Um, introduce yourself to the audience. Just enter. You do it, girl. Hi, everyone. I'm Kimoy. I am a tech writer, a web analyst, all that good stuff. And I'm excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of the tech industry and helping you guys accelerate your career so you can get that money and invest that money. <laughs> you know, earlier today, I, I thought I'd bring you on the show because earlier today I was reading an article about how to do the fire movement without being so miserably cheap. I just busted out laughing wow. article because it was, it basically said so many people that are in the fire movement are in tech and you know, where is that from and why is that happening? And, and I just, you know, there was an article that popped up and it said half a million. Let me make sure I read this right. Many tech jobs will go unfilled. Okay. Yes. It said that they did a math. They looked up. There's 10 million IT workers in the United States that roughly half of the 1.6 million job openings Generated this year will go unfilled. This That's a shame. Uh, That's a yeah. shame. Now I have yeah. my own gripe with the fire movement, but I don't want to cause any trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, literally, but that's just that's just it. Literally, it was saying United States has nine million available STEM related jobs, and seventy percent of them are related to computers and IT. Yeah, but they just do not have folks. I mean, like literally. Let me tell you this number as well. I can show you the article, but it said that only 49,000 people graduated with computer science last year. Mm. And then they were saying uh, California, because of all kinds of reasons, is expected to see a 2.5 million sh shortage of workers. Yeah, yeah. that's really bad. That's really sad because it's like opportunity is there waiting for us to, to grab it and no one is, you know, taking hold of these opportunities. Like you don't have to be like some genius to actually get these jobs, you know? And a lot of companies are providing on the job training. Now, um, I got an email recently from someone who worked at, uh, he works at Chase and he signed up for the tech writing course. And he said, Chase literally sent out an email to their employees that they have to learn technology. So if, you have companies that are basically encouraging their existing employees to build these skills. So yeah, got to take advantage. You know, uh, something someone said in the comments already is something I was going to go talk about anyway, but I, I mean, long story short, DJ Cadillac said, I teach cybersecurity and he said, black folks are the first ones to drop out due to lack of interest. Now I would say mm -hmm. this is a, an American phenomenon. We, we have a school system and we have a co culture where, if it's not exciting, if it's not my passion, you know, I don't want to do it. And then wonder why we're really struggling with the economy. You don't have any money in a lot of these jobs that are, you know, they're they're called skilled jobs for a reason. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But I disagree with that, though. I think it's how you present it and how mm -hmm. you learn about technology, because it might not sound exciting, but you use technology every single day. Like you know, Facebook and Instagram and Netflix and YouTube and all that stuff, technology is behind it. So I think once you make the connection of the things that you use every day, you can actually help to build it. Like when you use your Alexa and your Google Home and smart TVs and smart homes and video games, like somebody is creating that stuff. So, and they're making good money creating that stuff, mm -hmm. but you're on the other end buying it and thinking it's not interesting. I disagree with that 100%. Right. So I think it's also to, there is something to be said about how we're teaching kids about tech. Yes. Um, and yeah. that, and because every video, I mean, right now I Googled this before we got on. Every video is like, IT jobs without coding. IT jobs without math. IT yeah. jobs without this, right? And we're having people kind of run away from math, run away from yeah. hard problems. 
Um, I, I think it's a campaign because we have been conditioned to be afraid of math. So now there's kind of like this thing where, okay, well, let's just say, here's how you can learn how to build an app without learning how to code. Here's how you can, um, you know, do things without the quote unquote hard stuff. But it's, you're right. It's absolutely how we're teaching kids and what, and what they've been learning about technology and math. But, you know, I mean, I myself, even though I studied electrical engineering, when I went into the first computer science course, and I saw all those lines on the screen just to make like a ball bounce. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. But now coding, like when you learn about Python and the different forms of coding, it's not that complicated, you know? So you just have to tie, As I think as long as you make that connection with what you're actually creating, then you will see that it's actually more interesting and it's not as intimidating as it, it may seem. Right. Yeah. So the reason two I want to bring on is it's, it's that time of year where all these kids have graduated and they realize mm -hmm. these jobs aren't paying what they like and they want to travel. And I was like, who better to bring on than someone who'd be traveling all the time and still working? <laughs> <laughs> yes. In two and weeks, I'll be out. <laughs> well, tech allows you to do that, right? You know, if you look at it. <clears throat> yeah. And there are a couple of things that allow me to travel, I would say. Um Number one, of course, is having a good paying job. Number two is actually saving your money, right? Because you could ball out out, out of control. <laughs> mm -hmm. And number three is the type of job that I have. So if you are, um, so if you're the type of person that likes to be self-employed, you could do that with tech writing because you could um, sign up for like six months contract you get paid very well. And then after that contract is up, you take a little bit of a break and then you continue on rinse and repeat. So you could do that as well. So, um, yeah. And for if there's anyone in college that's watching or if you know someone who is in college and they're in tech and they look like me and you, right? I need you guys to tell them to go to the financial aid office every single semester. Like every semester, even during the summertime, there are companies that will have these smaller scholarships for minorities or women in tech. Um, so every semester I went into my college's financial aid office and they would have like a $500 scholarship in the middle of the year that nobody else knew about, but I would go in there, sit down and fill out the application and write an essay. And I use that money to pay down my college student debt. So I want students or anyone, adults, you know, even if you're not in college to like look at the job market and try to figure out how can you maximize your dollars with what's available? Because like Erica said, there are so many jobs out there and they pay well, but we're not aligning ourselves with what's available out there. We want to get whatever degree we want to get, but we still got to be smart and think about paying that stuff down so that we can have a little bit of room to travel and, and invest in whatever it is that you want to do. I mean, so many things you just said are spot on, honestly. Literally, uh, there I worked in financial aid, everybody knows that whole story. But literally, you would every year, families would set up loans, different people would set up scholarships, and nobody would apply. Yeah. It would sit there completely empty, right? Um, there would be uh, companies that would do like little events and all you had to do is come listen to the seminar and then you could apply to stuff and people would miss it all the time they'd be like it was yeah. when when uh what what you're saying is spot on i have friends right now who are older and they're like oh my daughter can't find scholarships and i'm like bull crap <laughs> like, <laughs> like, i used to recommend it that means she didn't go in the office and she just wants you to shut up asking her about it pretty much but uh, <laughs> For yeah, no, and, and I've done it for my alma mater. I had um, like a little $1,000 scholarship and I was very specific about who could actually win the scholarship. So, you know, it's not difficult. I didn't require like, you know, you had to have a 4.0 or anything. I wanted it to go to a, a minority, but there were little scholarships like that every single semester 
And even big companies, like I think I got a GE, well, GE is a little sketchy now, but I think back then I had like a $500 GE scholarship or some people um, who are, you know, alumni that are much older, they would have a little $1,000 scholarship and stuff. So yeah, I would say definitely go to the financial aid office. Online is a little bit more competitive, but yeah, go to the colleges themselves. And and the, and the thing is, you people would come in there and have such an attitude. They get their bill or whatever. They'd be like, oh, you know. And I'm like, first of all, calm down. Second <laughs> of all, like if you come in there and you're serious, there's just countless ways they want to help you because you know they get a bit bonuses and incentives too for making sure so many people apply. Like, oh, we had you know ten thousand students get you know applications and scholarships this year. Even if you don't win them, they it looks good on them too. So that's why I laugh when people sit here and go, oh, there's no scholarship. I'm like, that's crap. Um, and then there's a thing called ASHRAE. I'm, I'm going to say it wrong. Give me a break. But it's for girls. And all my female engineer friends here, they would go, you know, just spend a few hours and they would go and do something on Saturday or create different things. And it was so unique because it's like, oh, we do. And it's kind of like A-S-H-R-A-E. Uh, I know I'm feeling okay. but it's ASHRAE and they do like girl Sunday and it's just a way for the engineering companies to basically, Hey, here's some money. Uh, <laughs> here's some money. Yeah. We're attempting to recruit women. We're attempting to, um, you know, fill these positions any way we can kind of conversations. Um, yeah. There's a lot more organizations. I think black girls, cold, they have yeah. summer camps. I think it's engineer um, girl is one of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, there's like right now I can type in if you go in your computer right now, you type in minorities and tech scholarships, your computer will explode. OK, I mean, like they're building over backwards to reach out. And so a lot of times when you talk to parents, um, I get it. They don't want to. Oh, I don't want to spend too much money or I don't want to have all this stuff for my kid or or, you know, be trying to um, burden them with debt. But that's that's a part of the conversations of being an adult and being a parent. Like, I think people yeah. think, oh, you're 18. I did my part, man. Good luck. Like, I know. I know. Yeah, we need to be more honest about that debt that comes with it. I mean, but I, I knew I had that mindset that because I didn't have money. So I was like, who's going to pay for this? I didn't have that expectation that my family would pay for college. So I. That's why I was in the office every single semester trying to figure out how to pay down that debt. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally. And there's, there's opportunities for, for people outside of college. So it's not just yeah. for college students, but mm-hmm. um, like I mentioned earlier, Chase and all these corporations, they're launching job training programs to help working professionals get into those fields. So. Yeah, right now I'm looking at We Can Code It Partners gives a hundred thousand hundred million dollar scholarship fund for women and minorities. Wow. You know, I, I I literally can just name off company after company, and and the problem is it, it's what I see usually. Erica, I'm forty, and can, am I too old? To go I know, <laughs> too old to go into tech. Like, I'm for real, y'all. You may live to be eighty five. Like, I'm seeing more and more people. You know, eighty five year old man gets evicted, 90 year old woman gets evicted. I'm like, what is going on? Like people are living a long time. So even if you just do the basic math that you go from making 35 to 45 a year to making 90 a year, even if you only make it for five years, because a lot of people, your a lot of your concerns are, Erica, I'm getting older. Will I be able to apply for these jobs? I would much rather you be older applying for tech because I have a friend who's 50 right now. He's applying for tech jobs than be 45 applying for a fast food job or 45 applying for a job that you know you're overqualified for. You, it's going to take some have to get out of your comfort zone, but there's money out here. And I, I don't even know how to explain it to you, but I have friends who literally the companies here gave them six months off. I think I've told you this. They gave them six months off because they didn't want to lose them because they spend so much money recruiting technical oh. people. They gave them six months off. And I was like, I'm like, you're on vacation. She's like, yes. <laughs> I'm on vacation wow. and I'm like, That's crazy. What? but it costs them so much money to train and rehire that it's easier for them to allow some of these people to get two month vacations and six month vacations. And that's what's going on here in Austin, Texas. 
I mean, right now here in Austin, Texas, they have um, they have like I told you so many the network administrator, just different things they're offering for absolutely free. And people mm-hmm. are like, well, I don't know. I'm like, it's free. And it at least right. gets your foot in the door at Dell. It gets your foot in the door at a lot of these. Te- I mean, there's a company here called Force Point, and it just bought up four or five other companies. There's another company here, uh, Salesforce. Salesforce bought up some other people's companies. It's crazy. Yeah. So, and Salesforce hires a lot of tech writers, too. So I, I like Salesforce. Um, they're practically in almost every their their technology is in almost every major company that you know about. So, but I also want to say for those who are forty plus um, or even college age or whatever age, one thing to keep in mind is that the way to get a job has also changed, right? So you no longer um, just fill out an application online and sit down and wait and hope that someone reaches out to you. Right. You kind of have to do a little bit of I like to call it like the Diddy approach. Right. Because Diddy has he creates this whole awareness and brand about what he's about. And then he gets these major deals or forms his own, basically creates his own job. So in today's world, you have to create your own brand and let people know this is the kind of work that you want to do. And the best place, the number one place to do that is on LinkedIn. So Mm -hmm. if you are not on LinkedIn and you want to get in tech, but you're sitting at home filling out applications online and hoping and praying someone's going to reach out to you, then you got to switch things up a little bit. So that's why in my course, I teach people, you have to know how to put yourself out there so that you can get the recruiters to reach out to you. When I post on my Instagram, I'm not even on the job market. And every single day a recruiter is reaching out with um, different tech writing contracts. Um, And my LinkedIn is not even up to date anymore. (laughs) You know, but because I've put in the work, right? I did my DD promo, it's still there and people are still finding me. So the way to get a job is a little bit different now, especially a tech job. So I'm telling you, look, they're like, oh, IBM's cutting people. I'm like, yes, IBM cut a thousand people, but they also hired 9,000. So there are several companies that have been hiring on a hiring spree because HB1 visas are not cheap. It's not cheap to get these visas. It's not cheap to hire people from overseas. It's much cheaper and much more efficient to hire Americans and also train you here. So right. I, I, I like I keep trying to let y'all know that so many times. But I, a lot of those Indians and, and the, um, you know, Asians, well, Indians are Asians, but all of they have the skills. So companies are willing to actually bring them over. Uh, when I was at Google, it was mostly um, Asians that I was working with. So, you know. Yeah. It, I mean, it happens. But what yeah. people, people have to kind of, uh, there's a lot I want to say, but I'm like, people have to, like right now on ZipRecruiter, if you type in technology job, it'll be like $40,000, $74,000 check job. It, it breaks out your different listings. Like right now, LinkedIn, has an article about 2,000 plus information technology jobs in Austin, Texas. Like, you guys don't even know, there was a moment where I was like almost about to quit and just (laughs) go do tech. I had friends who were like, girl, we'll get you in the door. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff um, just out here, period. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, let me, let me, there was stuff I was gonna show. I think I had an article about Amazon bringing 800 new tech people, just mad tech stuff coming here. Yeah, and you don't just come here and I'm don't here. count it out. You never know what you're gonna like because all of this stuff is new technology, cybersecurity, um, voice operating uh, devices, um, coding, all that stuff is new. Like, I mean, you don't even have to be that technical. Like I said, I'm I'm writing every day. That's that's what I do. I am literally running Google Analytics for my for the company that I work for. And I'm saying, hey, you guys need to change this this text. It's as simple as that. You need to add a button here. <laughs> like that's what I get paid to do. So it doesn't even have to be that complicated. If you are someone who um, find yourself like 
wanted to make things a lot more easier to understand. If you like instructions or maybe teaching or explaining how things work, then you could look into technical writing. Um, so you don't even have to do any coding whatsoever. So for sure. I'm yeah. going to share my screen so they can see some of what I'm trying to sh show them. Hold on. And thank you for coming on in your afternoon, you know, making buttons happen. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, this right here is U.S. Tech Hubs. So most people think Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. Oh, my God, California. Of course, I have to show you. This is some of the top ones right now. Austin talks about us keeping it weird. Right now, we have a million dollar population, whatever. And the number goes up and down. We have 2,234 tech companies, 76,000 community members, and we're kind of low on the most expensive city because, you know, we're kind of cheap. But again, e-commerce, software, and cloud. If you are in Austin, you have heard these three words repeatedly. When all those companies and Shopify and all these little Visa, Indeed.com is here in Austin, Texas. So when people say, oh, I'm, wow. Indeed, I'm like, Indeed is right here. You can literally, where my old house used to be, you can literally go around the corner and stop at Indeed. <laughs> like, literally. Um, but here, you know, if you guys can see it, Big Commerce are, you know, they won, I think this is Home Away. It might be different. They won Austin Best Places to Work. Uh, there's Visa here. There's, you name it. Uh, top, you can click this button. I'm not going to do it right here, but you guys can click this on your own. You get to view the top 100 companies in Austin. So it goes over here. This is a perfect example why I want to show you all this. Um, I'll go over the other cities, but just so you can see this. Cost of living in Austin compared to San Francisco. <laughs> no bedroom, 1400 which is very expensive. Uh, it's, it's talking about a particular side of town. Rent, one bedroom, $3,746 in San Francisco. Medium home price, $300,000. San Francisco, $1.2 million. Now, now look at your pay, though. Now, people are going to say, but Erica, if I move, I have to take a cut in pay. Look right here. You're getting 132000 That's average compared to 144000 in San Francisco. Where would you rather be? Where would you rather be? Okay. So now you're saying, well, Erica, look at uh, UX, which is, I think you said is customer service, UX uh, and design. No, no, that's user experience. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. Uh, so you're making 100000 here in Austin compared to 135000 So that is definitely a cut. But again, cost of living, product, marketing, these departments. Yeah, you're taking a cut, but cost of living. So again, marketing, um, UX, customer experience, excuse me, sales, product, finance, operations, data analysis. So again, Boston made it up here um, and they have 1,600 companies. They have hardware, security, and ed tech. Now, this sounds something, someone told me about Massachusetts having a lot of AI, so I would believe this, the hardware part, for sure. Um, again, it does comparison, Boston. Chicago, so 5,000 tech companies there. Wow, that's actually surprising. FinTech, Health Tech, and Big Data. Okay, then you have, uh, scroll on down, Colorado. Colorado has 3,000 tech companies. Good Lord. Ad tech, software, and mobile. Then you have uh, Los Angeles, of course, is back up in there. But you know, ain't nobody trying to live out there like that. It's <laughs> 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 got 3,500 tech companies. Real estate, interesting. Digital media and fintech. Uh, then we have Seattle, which, I mean, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. 1,700 tech companies. So not as many, but... Um, it's got marketing tech, health tech, and software tech. So I just thought this was a really good um, to give you some, you know, some some comparisons, some numbers. Uh, built in is a great, you know, great little website here. Anyway, next is this is hilarious. It was like Venture Beat said Austin needs to do a better job of recruiting talent, <laughs> tech talent. <laughs> Look at our city. We we think you should just come here, eat tacos, and enjoy the life. Right. So. Um, <laughs> Long story short, that's kind of funny. The first intro of the article says, Austin is hot, and I don't mean 100 plus degree temperature summers or the green chili pork at Torchy's Tacos. Long and story short, it talks about they need to do a better job of, of um, recruiting. So that's all. Uh, yeah, I agree. Oh, wow. Transform 2019, the AI event of the year. Anybody know about that? Hmm, what's that about? Interesting. Um, okay.
Sorry, squirrel. Uh, where's the next one? And then this one says Amazon will bring 800 new tech jobs. Now, why do I think this is important? Many times people say, well, Amazon's bringing a warehouse or it's bringing this. When I hear tech jobs, I think that is a longer term deal for me because it's the internal workings of a business. Not that warehouse isn't important, but that to me is right. the internal working of a business. Correct? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, that's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So right now it's basically engineering, research, science, cloud computing. And there you go on that. But uh, the reason I want to bring you on is, is I think right now it's that time of year where kids are graduating. And have anybody seen this amazing website? Have y'all seen this before? <laughs> um, and even if you're not in those big cities, so um, just in the past couple of weeks, I've gotten emails about opportunities in Columbia, South Carolina, Weathersfield, Connecticut, Darefield, Illinois, Santa Clara, California, and Shoreview, Minnesota. So, I mean, if anyone is near those areas, hit me up and let me know. I'll send you the information. Okay, say them again. You got information. I'll say it one more time. So, tech writer positions in Columbia, South Carolina, Weathersfield, Connecticut, Deerfield, Illinois, Santa Clara, California, and Shoreview, Minnesota. Oh, in Maryland. Yeah, that's a good, that's a different, that's a collection. Listen, man, y'all better, y'all better get to call her. So, Jesse said, are tech writing jobs remote? Uh, some of them are, some of them aren't, just depends on the company. Um, most of them have flexibility so you can work from home a few days, depending, like if you're working for a government client, um, they might require you to be on site, especially if you're using their equipment. I know um, security. <laughs> right, yeah. So it just depends on the company or client, but there are remote jobs. Okay, it said Amazon, someone said Amazon just bought land to expand in Kentucky. Interesting. Uh, and Amazon is taking over everywhere. <laughs> yeah, Kansas City is also on the rise. That is correct. I was going to Google something to show, but uh, HubSpot is hiring a lot of people in Boston. Let me see. Cloud and data. Okay, this says... Um, Greetings from hot Phoenix. What's up? Oh, okay. One thing I also found out about tech industry is that they will interview with felons and hire them because they need positions filled badly. Anthony Bolden. That's true. That's true. Chase also recently announced that. So the demand is there. So if the demand is there, that means they're willing to do almost any and everything. I think someone sent me an email to um, asking if they have uh, a record, if that impacts their ability to get hired. You just got to look at the companies. They're literally putting out articles and thought pieces about hiring people who have some kind of criminal record. So I wouldn't count it out 100%. Just do your research and see which companies are posting about it and, and go for it. For sure. All right, DJ Cadillac gave us a 199 super chat. Thanks for getting the knowledge out to our people. No worries. Um, Erica, I'm 49 and I'm ready to get this shimoni. As long as you're <laughs> breathing, it's never too late. This is so true. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you, guys, listen, there is a whole, to me, what I'm seeing in tech is like they're creating tech for people who don't want to learn and they're creating tech for people who want to know more, right? Like I see that every day. I see people who are like, just explain it to me. Just show me. Just just do it for me. And that yeah. that's a that's a great opportunity for people to get into the door because they'll always need somebody just to type it up so somebody can just do it without having to learn or anything. Yeah, and that's the whole point of technology is to make it as intuitive as possible. So a lot of people need to work behind the scenes to make that happen. So when you download your apps and it's just you know, very few words on the app or arrows that telling you where to go next or pop-ups um, or bots that are telling you what to do next. 
It's also that the user doesn't really have to think that much. But you, you, if you want a job in tech, you have to think, well, who the heck is creating that button? Like, who's the one that's creating that um, message bot? Like, you got to think about that. Who's the one that created Alexa, Alexa voices and stuff? Like, who's the one doing that work? And that's where the opportunities are. You know, you ever see you go to a website, you see the little chat box pop up. I always yeah. like, who thought of that? That's perfect. Someone had to think of it, right? Yeah. Um, Cosmic Wisdom said, man, IT is a grind. You earn every penny you get. Now, I would say everything is a grind, right? Like, there's no job in America that's going to be super cakewalk. Like, even nurses are like, oh, being a nurse is hard. I'm like, yeah, I believe it. Wiping butts and creating people is probably hard. So it was like, no matter what you do, it's going to be always going to be somewhat of a drive. So uh, Christian said he's got a interview July 22nd. Fingers crossed. Oh, congrats. SB said he's currently taking Kamoy's class. Yay. <laughs> Let me see. Cam's going to. I have a Q&A session for my students coming up on Sunday. So, so Q and A on Sunday. What do the students get on your Sunday Q and A? So I have uh, homework assignments for my students. They have to create um, technical uh, content, so that's their opportunity to actually upload their samples that they've created, and I get to basically do a one-on-one -on -one review. Or if they're updating their resume or their LinkedIn profile. I can take a look at it for them on Sundays. So that's what I do on my Q&As. I want to make sure people are prepared for these jobs. So um, like I mentioned earlier, it's kind of the Diddy approach where you build your personal brand. So I want every single person, whether they're going into tech writing or not, to have a portfolio because companies want to see that you're actually interested in doing the work and that you can do the work so it's kind of like a little backwards where you got to do the work before you get the work <laughs> mm -hmm. so you have to have a portfolio of some sort so i do the q a um roughly once a month or maybe twice a month so that people can get their portfolios reviewed okay that's good i mean you guys have a lot of conversation going on holy crap um <laughs> let me see this guy said, I'd rather earn 90K than 36 a year in customer service. Listen, customer service is, I, everybody does their time in customer service and then I have to cut that off. Like when you're young, whew, well, you can deal with people young, but after a certain time, it, it pays to go up in experience. Um, what was something I was going to ask you? Goodness. Oh, uh, Brittany Hudson said, when does your class start? How long is this session? So the class starts when you start. <laughs> <laughs> so the lessons, the videos, the um, quizzes, everything is already in there. So you go at your own pace. Um, the live Q&A session is this Sunday. So if you sign up um, between now and Sunday, then you'll get um, the opportunity to bring your portfolios. If you work fast, <laughs> then I can review it for you. But chances are, depending on how quickly you move through the course, then maybe next month you can get your review. So, And I remember you saying like the, what was the best explanation? You said like explaining how something works. Give us a good yes. like, oh, procedures at work. Give us that, explain that to us one more time. So let's say that, for example, when you fill out um, an application on your bank's website, um, they have instructions on how to fill out that application. So someone has to write those instructions. They might have little clues that tell you like, enter your first name here, or they might have a message bot or the text that's on the button that says submit, or do you want to cancel? That's like a simple form of instructions or technical writing. A more complicated form would be um, the behind the scenes of how an application works. So let's say, how does the operating system for Microsoft works? You need to explain that to um, software engineers, or you need to explain that to a tech person. Then you have to break it down step by step as, as to how that operating system works. Um, I have some examples on the, the page that 
Erica is showing you guys. Go down. When we go down, um, it's at the top. So, yeah. Um, right so, yeah. So that one is instructions for how to use Google AdWords platform. So that's for companies that want to, you know, run ads on Google. Those are that's an example of instructions. And the one below it is technical specifications. So when you when you buy a new phone or you buy a new laptop and you see the specs. Someone has to write that stuff up and that someone is a tech writer. So um, earlier we saw um, on the website that you were sharing that there's a role called UX. So user experience. Mm -hmm. That's also a form of technical writing. So that's basically um, more like the apps, your mobile apps, the instructions on the app. And you see like a pop-up arrow or pop-up tips and stuff like that that's used that's part of the user experience um process okay okay so if somebody was at work and they do they do a type of like whatever like they when they come there in the morning they do a certain procedure to start their day could they write that out would that be considered i remember you were telling us yeah yeah exactly so those are um procedures and policies and stuff like that. So that's also part of technical writing. So it doesn't necessarily have to be tech related. It's really instructions um, on how to do something. So your audience could be, a, you know, um, your coworker that needs to know how to do something. That's a form of technical writing. Um, job aids, manuals, um, yeah, any form of instructions, basically. There's a method to how to actually write that type of content so people can actually do it without having to think that much. So that's what I teach in the course. Um, yeah. I like it. I like it. So when people, what are some of the biggest challenges people have when it comes to tech writing? I think the biggest challenge is uh, making it as easy as possible. I think we think too much and we don't realize the steps that we're taking. So we kind of skip over those steps because we already know how to do something. Like if I were to, or if anyone was to explain to someone how to, let's say how to make pancakes, right? And you just tell someone, okay, um, get the pancake mix. But first you have to say, well, you need to get the money to go to the store and you need to buy this specific pancake mix, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to be very detailed and very basic. Like you're talking to a child. Um, and I think thinking about the person in that way is actually a bit of a challenge for many people. So, you know, uh, that is perfect. Okay. So imagine trying to tell someone who's never done how to make pancakes, how to make pancakes. First, right. go to the store. <laughs> <laughs> the or how to use a coffee machine, right? Not everyone um, knows how to make coffee at home. So try explaining that to a little kid. How do you make it? And, you know, write it down. And it's not as easy for, for some people to actually do. Or someone who's new to this country and they're learning how right. to make product for the first time. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Somebody said um, working with engineers and DVs, I guess developers have mm -hmm. trouble with instructions. Yeah. Um, someone said their company is hiring proposal and tech writers in Philly and San somewhere, Leandro or something. When I was in AF, I used to create technical orders and checklists. You really have to dumb it down to an extent. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to say that, but that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think of whenever we talk about dumbing stuff down, people think, oh, I would never need to dumb it down. But um, you ever see parents trying to or grandparents trying to use t a texting on the phone or apps on the phone that think like that, like make it so it's yeah. so easy. Your 90 year old grandma can get on the computer and do it. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, and even for people who are very skilled, like even for the developers or engineers, when you have to give them specs on how to use something, I mean, you know, you still have to break it down so that they know exactly what to do. 
Um, I didn't know, I don't know how to code, but there are applications I've worked on that I had to basically teach developers how to use our backend system. So I had to talk to engineers and say, okay, what's the code? What do they need, right? What do the other developers need? Um, so I don't need to know exactly what the code, how to write the code, but I need to know that the developer needs the basic instructions. He needs this code to be able to work with our system. So it's really just breaking it down step by step. I'm telling you guys, listen, it's, it's, it, there is, there's a job for everything. Do you know how you have something where you say like, there's a job in between a job, right? So like, even though your manager is here, there has to be someone to explain it to the rest of the shift, you know, the shift manager. And then your shift manager explains it to all the workers. That to me is what I think of when I, when I, when I say technical writing. I think it's like you're just the go between. Right. There's some kid who's like, yeah, just do it like this. And you're like, no, people will understand that. And then you write out a whole series of processes. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I worked at. um the U.S. Postal Service, these are regional managers and they have to run reports to see how well their division is doing, how how are the p delivery performances. And just to run that report, they needed instructions on how to run that report. And this is their job, you guys. But I literally had to create a manual on how to run that report and how to understand it so that they can report to the higher ups how well they're doing or how, how well they're not doing. So, yeah. Not, not to be dark, but I have to share this. I watched the show Chernob Chernobyl on HBO and the engineers that were doing the, um, working at the nuclear plant, they had notebooks full of notes. And sometimes people would cross out something and the other guy would be like, it's fine, just do it. Just go ahead, skip over it. And he's like, even the crossed out parts? Yeah, the crossed out part. So, there is a reason why we have people write down exactly step by step because some engineer or some really smart guy will just think you'll know what to do or assume you know the steps. And this happens more than you guys think. I'm um, for real. It just you need yeah. you need people who are in between writers. So let me see. Yeah, I mean that happens with me in every everyday life. Like I think I know. <laughs> And then I have to go back and go, you know, step by step, go back to the basics. It's just a human thing where you think you have, you, you're a know-it-all in a lot of, a lot of ways. So, um, but we have to learn how to learn. I love how someone said, I started looking at them. Now, this is funny. I'm going to read it to you. Okay. Looking at tech jobs online, most want an applicant to have one to two years experience in tech writing. Where do I go to start obtaining experience? You go to your existing job. You go to your everyday life. So this is what I explain in the course. Everyday things that you use needs instructions. Um, so this is where the part where you learn how to build a portfolio, um, whether it's at your job or in your everyday life, there's some document that's out of date or there is something that needs to be explained better. So you need to use your everyday life and create a portfolio. That's what I did. And you can do it too. So don't just, just because it says one to two years, don't count yourself out. You, I'm sure you've written instructions, maybe not that great of instructions, but I'm sure you've had to write instructions on how to do something at your job. Um, or there is, um, a process that needs to be improved or explained at your job, but it's not written down anywhere and it's frustrating for your coworkers. So if you can work on that, you could use that to build your portfolio and get the job that way. So just because it says two years, you actually probably have more experience than you think. So I love how somebody in the comments said, forget experience, apply anyway. Listen, yes, yes. Our <laughs> president and most of the jobs you see haven't taught you anything. Apply anyway. Like there's so many companies who will train people if they're competent, if they're smart, if they're willing to if they can answer questions on the fly. Like, listen, there's a lot of ways to go around it. Someone said do volunteer work. Also, Cam Cam said do up work. It can help build a portfolio as well. And somebody okay, she said great examples, Kamoy. Great examples. So I definitely, I don't want to suck up all her afternoon enjoyment. I just wanted to bring her on here 
because I thought about all the college students and the kids not even going to college who are like, don't worry, mom and dad, I can get a job. And this is a great place to start because a lot of this is proving you can do it. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's a great place to start. And if you happen, you get to work with so many other creative people. Um, you get to work with engineers. I love working with designers. Um, I love working with people in communications. So even if you start out in technical writing, your career could take you so many different places. Like I didn't expect that I would be writing instructions on how to use Google AdWords or helping um, municipal bonds get their, their deals right. Or right now I'm helping a, a travel company with their regulations and it's just so many different avenues. If you're in the medical field, if you're in some other industry, there's always a need for this kind of work. So I highly encourage you to check it out. You just never know where your career might go. All right, you guys, look, it's all up in the links. I'm going to bring Kamoy back on when there's tech stories and tech news. There's a couple big things happening in Austin. I'm going to save it up and like let her come back on and talk about it. But I'm telling you, this is a great place for a lot of people in the community are like, oh, you know, you know, discrimination bias or hire bias, hiring biases. If you can do the work or you can show you have a portfolio, man, this is this is where it's at, you guys. Plus, look at this. Look at this fancy website she got, y'all. <laughs> your portfolio, OK? Learn the five step strategy to creating any piece of technical content. Lesson two, how to create an instructional content exercise. Exercise three, how to write text on web applications. Y'all, she got the glasses up here, y'all, for real. Step-by-step -step walkthrough of creating your own professional bait thinks piece. Uh, module two, update your resume. And module three, update your job search profiles. Attract the recruiters like a magnet. Wow, dude, thank you. Cosmic Wisdom gave us $20 for the show today. 20 years ago, right. I started out as a technical writer while going through college. Thanks, Kamoy, for dropping knowledge to Erica for hosting. I love it. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> so nice. Someone said, Ilona Brown said, I started out in tech as a quality assurance analyst with zero experience. Somebody else said, their IT department in Marietta, Georgia, doesn't have cert certified associates, just learning on the job. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And for the person that said quality assurance, I actually did that too. And that was part, that was what I used as part of my portfolio because quality assurance is essentially writing down instructions on how to break an application. So basically you're testing how, how something works, right? So you have to implement certain steps and try to break it, like catch any errors and you have to follow it step by step by step. Um, so I hated that job. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, you basically get paid to break applications. But the person that actually wrote the steps is a tech writer or a quality assurance analyst. So those skills work for, for um, different types of jobs, too. For sure, man. Yes, you can write test strips. She got mm -hmm. a, a mini email course, too. I went through and gained understanding. I'm telling you guys, don't miss out. So I just have one real question. When are we going back to this blonde, baby? Nah. <laughs> oh, man. I hope I hope soon. I hope soon. <laughs> it's summertime. It's summertime. <laughs> I'm running every day, getting ready for the boat party that's going to happen in Austin, August 3rd and 4th. Um, I've got the I'm LA sorry. event. I've got, man, I'll be in Baltimore. Are you going to be in Baltimore or are you going to be busy? June 29th? I'm, I'm going to be in St. Kitts. <laughs> oh, look at you. Look at you. Look. <laughs> her, her, look, I'm going to go out there. Don't you worry. I'm going to squeeze it in this schedule somehow. I'm getting to them islands. Yes. I got to stop working so much. I got to stop working so much. So anyway, uh, anyway, you guys, definitely check out her course. This stuff is good stuff, you guys. I think you... What's what's changing in our field is the way to get hired, the way to get hired and the way to show you do things. I mean, if you can make websites or you can make little blogs, you can make little applications. You, you guys are in there. There's a lot of yeah. people I know who are very talented and this is where they need to be at. They need to be taking Kamoy class and they need to be out there applying. 
So yeah, and that's why I have that in in the course because I I learned about technical writing, but they didn't actually teach me how to get the job. So that's why I focused a lot of the modules on how to get the job. So um, even if you're not in a technical writing, at least look at modules two, three, and four, and that will help you get any job you want, even if it's not tech writing. So yeah. You see, how, look, she's looking out for people. See, y'all don't understand. Mo I mean, listen, module five, how to become a badass writer with on-job confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can't take all these jobs. I want more people that look like us to get these jobs. I mean, you know, Erica mentioned earlier, there's so many jobs that I'm not million, getting failed. A million jobs just sitting empty. It's actually close yeah. to 1.6 million, but, you know, again, they're out here for taking, but oh, you know what I want to finish it out with? Because someone had asked earlier, the fire movement, explain to them what the fire movement is to you and why you dislike it. That's it. That's your, that's your <laughs> question. That's your oh last man, question. you try to get me crucified. <laughs> Go ahead, finish it out. That's your last question. What is All the right, fire so, movement? So fire movement is <laughs> I happen to think it's a bunch of people who talk about being financially independent and they make money by talking about it. <laughs> um, so here's the thing. You, the, for those who have been watching Erica's channel, you know the way to become financially independent is to increase your income, reduce your de debt, and invest. Point blank, period. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Rock and Roll Dina said, true, I used Kamoy's resume lesson and got a job within a week. The hiring manager said I had a lovely resume. Still trying to get a check job, though. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. I love that. <laughs> yeah. For the guy who asked earlier, what is the fire movement? Fire movement is financially independence, retire early. And basically it, it became this buzz when really it was just the same people in tech who write the articles, who work at these companies. It kind of became this like circle conversation where, of course, if you make 130,000 a year, 120,000 a year, and you live off half your income for at least five years, you pretty much can get rid of your student loan debt, your, your home mortgage, your lot of stuff. But that's the key. People, people making less income try to do the fire movement or Dave Ramsey and they get frustrated because they're living very, very cheap. They're eating on beans and rice every night. They're cutting yeah. out. They're doing stuff that is a little bit. Yeah, I, I don't think that the community was very honest. Um, I, you know, you see them living these kind of minimalist lifestyle, but they make a lot of money. And I think a lot of people are scared to say that they make a good living. They make a lot of money. But you have to tell people that, like, you can get these high paying jobs. Yeah, you could live like you're poor and post a, a Instagram video about, you know, you don't have a lot of furniture, but if you're making six figures, tell people that. Like don't hide that information and say, you know, you're you're saving 50% of your income. You can't do that to someone who's making 30,000, 40,000. Like you got to tell them, "Hey, Number one, increase your income. <laughs> if you are doing every single thing that you can to save whatever you can and you are struggling still, then the thing that you need to step back and do before you think about retiring early is increase your income. And you could do that through getting a higher paying job or investing the little bit of money you have and letting that money grow. But don't just front and, and say, I'm living bare bones when you're really not. So that's, when that's what you feel with. You're making a hundred grand. We only live on 50. Well, yeah, it's really right. to help people to do that. Well, and also too, here's the thing. Um, there's two schools of thought. One part of the fiber movement is like, pay all your debts down. Okay, I've explained to y'all, you can pay all your debts down your house and your car, but you're still gonna need money to maintain your property taxes and small fees. Uh, then on top of that, you're going to need, you know, or the other side of it is, buying rentals. Okay. Well, how are they buying rentals? They make high income so they mm -hmm. can afford their own payments. So there's, there's just that thing right now. So, um, Cam Cam said, I'm ashamed that I'm living like I'm poor right now, saving 60% of my six figure income. 
I like fire to an extent, but I'm planning on investing the rest. There, there's nothing wrong yeah. with reanalyzing saving your money as long as you're investing that money. Because at the end yeah. of the day, like money just sitting in your bank account is dead money. Yeah, no, there's no, there's nothing to be ashamed about, but just don't be saying, yeah, I'm saving 60% of my income. You should do it too. <laughs> it's easy for you to say when you're making. In the bathtub with money waving on himself like this. So <laughs> yeah, I just think it was a little, the, the movement was a little bit insensitive to, especially our community, because not a lot of us make that much money, you know, so that, that was my whole, and the whole retire early. I mean, well, and I think we have to redefine what retirement is. Like, do you know how much hate mail I got when Kendra Barnes came on the show and said she retired at 32? Do you know how many people wrote me and said, well, what is she going to do for the rest of her life? And I was like, <laughs> I'm married. She has <laughs> rental units. She's having a baby. She'll have things to do. Like, what are y'all talking about? Like, I really got like messages who people are like, Erica, I can't believe you're promoting that. And I'm like, retirement doesn't mean do nothing. Retirement, right. you just don't have to work a job you don't like to pay for crap you don't need or, you know, your stuff is, you know, you're in a position where you don't have to do that. But you got yeah. to backing me up. I was like, are you messaging me for real about a pregnant woman? Like, <laughs> like yeah, so, I think I think people again, the community was not really clear about what retire early meant. Yeah. And I think a lot of them were basically taking mini retirements, which is what I did. And which is what you can do when you work on contracts and stuff. But that's kind of fronting saying you're retired, but not you really, you know, so you, I, yeah. you travel in a nation. I'm like, bro, you really not retired. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so I just thought it was a little fraudulent, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next blog I wrote. The fire movement, fraudulent. Well, I love her, uh, what's her name? Came out of nowhere. What's her name? Uh, with the short brow haircut. Susie Orman. You guys um, are scammers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Susie, oh, Susie Orman is a little out of touch too because she said something about you need like Four million or so. I forgot what she said to retire, and it's like, what? Like now we have enough. So much money now that, like, to her, a million is probably like, what are you gonna do with that? Like, well, there's a great book called um, "How to Get Rich" by Dennis. Oh my God, I forgot his last name. He died, but he used to own all the magazine company. He owned a big magazine company in London. But his he was his book is hilarious. He did die a little young, but his book basically was like one to two million is comfortably poor. <laughs> That's what he said. And Man. He, was like, he was like, if something bad happens, you might have to sell everything, right? But the here's the thing. Grant Cardone the other day said, you know, cash flow is king, right? And somebody asked Grant Cardone, like, well, what's how do you do how much do you save? And he was like, What do you need savings for when you have all these investments just paying you money every month? And I was like, be careful, Grant. Like, there's a there's a line to it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some of the stuff that they're putting out there is from a place of privilege. So I think, again, is basically increase your income, yep. decrease your debt and have investments. The ultimate goal is for your investments to cover your expenses at least. And whatever that number is for you, regardless of your income, that is that is more um, relatable than saying, you know, <laughs> retire early. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I literally have people every day emailing me like, I really want to retire early. And I'm like, what, five years, 10 years? No, a year, two years. I'd be like, wait a minute. Listen, <laughs> back away from those articles. So, anyways, uh, all right, you guys, I don't want to stick up Kamoy's afternoon. <laughs> but I'll see you soon. I'll see you for the Baltimore event. Um, anyway, oh, you know, there's a jazz fest in DC. Did you know that? Yes. I might have to roll out there on the Sunday, but I'll keep you posted offline, offline. So okay, anyway, okay. all right, you guys. And Kamoy, tell them where they can find you on the internet. Um, oops. Uh -oh. uh, hit me up on Instagram, Kamoy M. Um, and check out the course, keepingupwithkamoy.com. Uh, I think Erica is posting the links in the comments. Um, so yeah. This was fun. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've, I've posted all kinds of links in there. Um, check out these links. 
Cam Cam's been posting them. Everybody's been posting them. Check out the links. You guys, thank you for having. Thank you for having Kamoy on back on the show. Thank you for being here tonight. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye.